So as I've thought through the, through the week, my intentions today have really just been to put the picture of who Jesus is and what he did in front of you and kind of get out of the way. Um, I, I want to I wanna paint for you a picture of how much he loves us. And I do believe that we see that clearly spelled out in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. We're going to look there at chapter 22, verse 24 through 34. As you're uh, turning there or starting to get your head around the idea that we're going to be looking a little bit at what happened around the Last Supper, uh, between really the, the, the Palm Sunday aspect of things, him marching into Jerusalem and the crucifixion, I also want to just encourage you because I don't know if you're looking for, for verses to dive a little deeper or to kind of navigate. I know some of you, I, I think it's healthy to reflect throughout the course of this week, but really any week, uh, on who Jesus is and what he did. Um, every week, just so that you know as believers, the Lord's Day is described as Sunday because that's the day Jesus rose from the grave on. And Easter itself is a, it's a man-made holiday, if you will. Um, there's a lot of underpinnings I won't get into, but here's what it is positively for the Christian world. It is a day to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to declare the gospel. And people are more likely on that day than any other day of the year to come to church. We're going to share the gospel three services. We're, going to, we're not talking about politics. We're not talking about side issues. We're going to talk about Jesus Christ and his cross, his resurrection. And so if you've got somebody that you know that needs hope in him, you bring them. Uh, because we'll share gospel that day. But as you look at uh, really what this week means, maybe you want a, a few chapters to kind of just read through and ponder how much he loves us, go a little bit deeper. John 13 through 17 is just golden. Uh, those of you that have been here around here a little bit know that those are chapters that, that I have loved. The Lord Jesus himself prays for us, for his disciples and those that would be followers of him that would come uh, later like you and I, that the disciples would lead to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And so as you work through, like, Good Friday's coming. Y'all know that, right? Y'all are awake. Y'all are, are kind of asleep for the second service. Did y'all have your coffee this morning? Uh, listen, he, so here's, here's the deal. So Good Friday will come, which rep represents really the, the time that he went to the cross itself. And then by Sunday morning, we'll be re reflecting heavily on his resurrection. Now, we've been talking about love quite a bit in recent weeks. We've been talking about what that looks like. We've referenced John 13, where it says, you'll know, they'll know you're my disciples and how you love one another. We've talked a lot about 1 Corinthians 13 and what true love looks like. But we also know that Jesus himself is the picture of love. He gave us, he gave us not just the image in his going to the cross, but even in how he loved his disciples uh, here at the end, it, it matters. In fact, they were not a perfect group of people. Y'all know that collectively, like he knew that he'd chosen a bunch of ragamuffins. I guess he knew that uh, because he picked them specifically. When we look at their lives and we see where they came from, not just, by the way, you don't have to be a ragamuffin because you're a fisherman, just, just saying. Uh, but, but these were not, I mean, they were a variety of backgrounds, but he didn't just, just pick the, the people that were the most religious of the group. And so um, he acknowledges, in the passage that we're going to look at today, he acknowledges their frailty, their humanness. But he also acknowledges in that process his expectation and belief of what their potential was. And so I think there's several things that come alive in this text. There's a couple of things that for you, um, that for me, uh, are routine in the sense that, yeah, Jesus was, he was a servant. So we're going to talk about that, but there's a couple of other things that come to light that I think are important for us to look at as well. Now, as I'm giving you the context of the, the, the chapter itself, Luke 22 comes after this supper that we're going to uh, celebrate in just a few minutes after Jesus institutes it. That's, they, they got these little subtitles here and it, it literally says, he institutes, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Well, what does that mean? He changed what was a historical supper that they had celebrated for generations uh, that they knew as the Passover in Jewish life. And he gave it a completely different meaning. Like he gave it a, a, a meaning relative to the cross during the time they were taking that meal. Now, if you don't know much about Jewish, Jewish history, and even if you do know a little bit, it's good to be reminded of it. 
In the Old Testament, we have stories of, uh, of literally God's deliverance of his people from Egyptian bondage. Surely you saw uh, Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments and all the, the stuff of them. That, 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 y'all not laughing. It, I know some of y'all like Charlton who? Um, it was an old movie about the Bible. And the, God's people were delivered from Egyptian bondage, right? Moses, remember that whole story? And so on the, the, at the time of the last plague which was the, the death of the firstborn, what God did is he sent, he told his people that they should sacrifice a lamb. And he said that they should take some of that lamb's blood and they should put it on the doorpost. This is all of, of the, the Hebrew people. They should put it over the doorpost uh, of all their homes. And then all the families that had that over the doors of their homes, the firstborn would be saved, would be uh, like the death angel would pass over. And sure enough, that's what happened, and God's people were delivered. And I won't give you all, you can go back and read on that this week if you want. There's a ton of detail there. But Jesus himself, in this picture of Good Friday and a crucifixion and a resurrection, he becomes the lamb. Like, this is the gospel story. And he literally, in the Lord's, I love little ones, they're awesome. Andrea, you're doing great. <laughs> um, you don't know, do you call her out and embarrass her worse or do you just does that make it okay? I think I made it okay, but I got to quit now uh, or it'll make it worse. So here's, it, so here's the gig. Here's the gig. So what you have with this Passover meal is, I want you to notice about the symbol. This day matters because, and, the, and, the, and the Lord's Supper matters because Jesus gave us a sacred symbol to remember him by. And he said, these elements that I'm about to give you reflect the body that I have that's about to be broken and my blood that's about to be shed for you. So we went from a lamb and its blood being put on the doorpost and all that have that being saved to the blood of Jesus and his crucifixion, even though he was uh, without sin, right? He took and paid our penalty. And so now he is becoming the sacrifice by which we are atoned. And he told them, I don't ever want you to forget this. Now, here's what's crazy. I said, I don't know if crazy is the right word here. It doesn't sound real academic. Uh, but in the middle of the turmoil of what's happening, coming into Jerusalem, them acting as though he was a king, they're going to turn on a dime. The community itself is like the people in Jerusalem are. There, it would have been a very full city because of all the Jews coming from all over the world to celebrate the Passover, right? This was part of what was happening in that place. There would have been more military presence out of concern of unrest and those kind of things. So the Roman presence would have been strong. And in the middle of all that, Jesus in preparation for this Passover, yes, he has them go and get the colt and he rides in on the colt and we see all these things happen. They prepared the room for them. But when they came into the room, when you read of that week, the first thing Jesus did was wash their feet. Now, this is the one they had deemed to be the Messiah. They were following him because he was the promised Messiah and they thought in their heart of hearts he was going to be the conquering king. They did. And so this is the king that we see institute this supper with this group of people. And when I show you how he loved him, like when we read the text and you see how he loved them in spite of them, it reminds us, oh, how he must love you and me, right? It reminds me of that old song uh, from way long ago. Uh, oh, how he loves you and me. And it's true. So with that said, I want us to look at Luke 22. He's washed their feet. He's instituted this supper and it didn't take long. Uh, after him saying, hey, we got Judas among us, it's gonna, he's going to be the, betray the betrayer. Uh, and then we find in Luke 22 that he says in verse 24, a dispute also arose to among them as to which would be regarded as the greatest. So they've already determined who's going to be the traitor. Now they're saying, well, but yeah, but who's going to be the greatest among us? And you can almost imagine, like pick a circle. Right? Like if you've got debate team, there's those that they're just really confident in their debate skills, I guess, like any good lawyer would be, right? Uh, and so they're like, I'm the best. No, I'm the best. I'm the best. Well, then, or maybe you've got a bunch of basketball players since it's March Madness weekend, right? And they're all confident that they're the best. Or you've got fishermen that think they are, or hunters that they're golfers, or I don't know, twirlers, or dancers, or whatever the case may be. They think they're the best. And they're talking smack. This is what they're doing. This human. And in the middle of this, like, Jesus knows what's coming. And so the dispute rose among who's the greatest. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And he said to them, because they think he's conquering king. The kings of the Gentiles 
exercise lordship over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors. I'm choosing willfully not to go sideways on this and get off track. But literally those that were in charge were wielding their power and authority in such a way that everybody served them and then all of the people under them were beneficiaries of their power. So they, they it, it got to, to benefit from all of the, the wealth and then distribute it as they sought fit to give favor to those that they ruled. So they lorded it over them. They were dictators. So the kings of the Gentiles, now when he says Gentiles, you know who that is, right? Everybody wasn't a Jew. So here they are celebrating the Jewish feast, all the extra Roman stuff. Later you'll hear their names thrown out like Pontius Pilate, right? So we got, we got these, these names of people that were leaders. Herod's name's going to be, they knew what this looked like. So they lord authority and those in authority over them are called benefactors. Um, but not so with you. This is what the world does. But not so, Jesus says, with you. And that would be with us, like my kingdom, my people. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest. And the leader is one who serves. For who is the greater one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it the one who reclines at at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are... Those who have stayed with me in my trials and I assigned to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom. So he's given them an assignment that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. They just had this supper. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon. So now he's going to address Peter specifically in his old name. Behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Now, this is a pretty heavy passage, but I also think it's a pretty personal passage for many of us in a whole lot of ways. And I want us to look at four different ways that we're able to see how Jesus loves us, that instruct us on how we should love others. And I dare say it elevates the standard and it challenges everybody. It's challenged me this week. It's caused, I like, I, I, repentance is the word that keeps coming to mind. Like when, when I read this and I think about us and and I think about the world we live in y'all maybe seen where it says uh somewhere uh the little quote that says you know if Paul if the Bible were written today Paul would be sending us a letter well he'd be sending a whole country one I think he would I think but I think I think when I read this it's like oh Paul probably has some things to me to say to me and I think probably Paul would have some things to say at each of our houses right uh and so it's with humility that I want us to look at this and look at how Jesus loved them first in verse 24 through 27, it says that he led and he loved by serving. When we look at Jesus and we know that Jesus is our example, yes, he came as sacrifice, but he's the example of who we aspire to be. He shows us how God interacts with us and how we should live life as God strengthens us, like imperfection, what that would look like when the Holy Spirit, uh, when we're surrendering to the Spirit and not to the flesh. And so we want more Jesus, less humanity. Um, And here's what it looks like. First, it looks like him leading by loving and serving. Um, He loved them by serving them. You say, well, where does it say that? Well, we read it as we went along in the the world that the Gentiles lord leadership over them. That's how they did it. He says, not so among you, not so in my kingdom. And he says, in my world, in my kingdom, those that serve are going to be the greatest. The least will be the greatest. The first will be last. The last will be first, right? Now, that's another text, but, it, but, it, but it's an amplification of what's written here. And literally, he's already shown them this in a couple of ways. Number one, he's showing them this, and then he washed their feet. In that setting, the leader didn't wash feet. 
And so they all came in. They know who he is. He is rabbi. He is Messiah. He is teacher. And as they were seated, he took the position of grabbing the towel. I mean, this is the, the setting that we're in. He took the position of grabbing the towel and coming and washing feet. And in the process of that, they're like, oh, no, you don't need to wash my feet. It's like, no, 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 this is what I do. We're serving. And so what we find is that he did it that way. But we also know that he was going to give his life for them. So that's kind of, a, it's kind of an expected that you, you know that this is true because we've seen the picture of the gospel. I'll tell you another thing that was a struggle is they literally did believe that Jesus was going to at some point like snap his fingers and all of a sudden, uh, I mean, if he could feed the many and he could bring Lazarus to come, come forth and he could heal the leper and do all these things, surely now's the time to conquer. And one of the places that Jews had it wrong is they had missed the text in the Old Testament that described the lamb that was slain. And, and by his stripes, we are healed. And the scriptures literally teach, we have a conquering king who is coming, but that he, he, he's coming and he's already won, but he's, the conqueror's not coming back yet, right? Like, like we, we anticipate it, we pray for it, we say, Lord Jesus and Holy Spirit come, but if we are looking at where we are in the world order of things in God's kingdom, it's already but not yet. We have victory in Christ, but we are like he hasn't returned yet. So what does that mean? We're still in the, the, the servant mode. He was the suffering servant that gave us that picture of how to live life. So what does that look like? Well, one of the ways that we see that come off the rails is after Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, many of, most of the Jews did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. Still true to this day, there are some Messianic Jews that believe Jesus was the Messiah. Not many of those, right? But, but there was a group, have y'all heard of the Maccabees? Some of y'all like, I know that name from somewhere. Some of you may know exactly, most of you don't. Uh, you would know it as the name of one of the couple of books that are in the Bible, or like not in the Bible, but that happened between, they're in the Catholic Bible. Uh, they happened in the period between Old Testament and New Testament. I won't lose you right here, but I want you to see this. These were rebel warriors with a Jewish background. Zealots. They believed that the Messiah was going to come and be conquering king, and it's our job to take up arms and make it happen now. And I want to tell you that as you look at the world around you, trying to figure out where do I fit in all of it, we still serve a suffering servant. He is conquering king and he is coming again, but his instructions to us have not been to, to, to be like the leaders of the Gentiles. His instructions to us are that we should serve, that we should love and that we should serve. I think it matters that we, that we hear that out loud. We also know that, I don't know if you're about y'all, that kind of intimidates me the way that he loved and served at the level that he did the sacrificial nature of it all the second thing that we see here is that he saw their sacrifice and he promised them a reward this is one of those things that i have not picked up on in the past normally i get so hung up on the leadership principles the servant leadership that reflects who jesus is and that should still reflect how by the way how we serve in the home and the business and and in the community we as believe let me pause for a second i missed something on this that i wanted to i didn't hit in either service really um, we ha have been preparing to serve. Many of you have already signed up to serve at Easter. Many of you serve your families. But this coming week, as all these folks come in that we don't get to sit, we're going to get to serve. We're going to get to be the church and be the body of Christ and serve people in his name. I'm excited about that, by the way. And so uh, I'm grateful that you guys are willing to come alongside us this coming week. But remember that whenever... The, the seats start filling up and we ask you to scoot over or you're, 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 you're trying to figure out things in the parking lot and somebody gets a little close to your car or uh, that baby over on the other side gets a little bit, whatever. You're, be patient and love and serve, right? Um, the second piece though, he saw their sacrifice and promised a reward. We see this like it's in the text. And that's, I, it, I read this and I'm like, wait a minute, did I, think, did I read what I thought I read? Verse 28, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials. This is Jesus talking to a group of, of men, his guys, one of whom, by the way, um, like Judas was going to betray him, but Peter was going to deny him. He's sitting at the table right then, and he says to them, 
you stayed with me through my trials, and I'm going to reward you for it. In other words, you're all disputing about, not you all, but, but he's saying to them, you're asking me who's going to be the greatest. You're going to be servants. But then he says, don't think I hadn't seen what you've done on my behalf. Don't think that I haven't seen your faithfulness. Don't think that I haven't seen the loyalty and every sacrifice that was made in the name of Jesus Christ. Like it, you, you, you thought it went down for nothing, that nobody saw it. And he's their leader saying, I see it. Literally, the text says, you are those that have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It just comforts me. I don't know if it comforts you. It comforts me. Is it fair to say that in this life, there is injustice that occurs? I mean, we've all had it happen at some point, haven't we? Some of you may be in the middle of it now. If you haven't been, you either have or it's coming. Because that's, that's the world we live in. Things don't happen on time. And we, we really shouldn't be living so that we get noticed anyway, right? But if you wonder, does God see my sacrifice? Yes. He sees your sacrifice. Now, you would think, I, I'm just, I'm way too human sometimes. I'm looking at this thinking, I see the sacrifice, but Peter's getting ready to deny him. I mean, that ought to push him down a little bit. I mean, can he, can he still, should he get the reward at this point? I mean, come on, he's fixing to deny him, and all of them are fixing to run. I mean, we give them a lot of credit for being scared of cats. Don't we? I mean, if, we, if you don't, then you probably haven't been in the church a long time, because we know that, and that's not a knock, you just... You got to know that whenever they came to arrest, they all ran. And the closest would have been Peter, who was watching at a distance, and still denied that he knew him. So, how much credit do they deserve? Here's the beauty I'm not perfect either. I'd like to think, as a frail saint that gets it right some days and gets it wrong some others, that God doesn't forget the good done in, in spite of my own failures. In this text, he makes it pretty obvious. He makes it pretty obvious that there's no action taken in sacrifice in his name that is forgotten, that there is, there is not going in the days ahead to be a reward as a result. We don't have a ton of, of reality like on, on what exactly it looks like, but I promise you, well, we like to say God's not going to be your debtor. He's not. But I promise you he's going to make it worth our, worth our while. So he saw their sacrifice. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to point out if you ask, what did they actually sacrifice? Y'all have experienced, y'all ever had, this is rhetorical, but within families, there sometimes are disagreements. Is that fair? That family, those things happen in families? And then when that happens, there's oftentimes pressure to, to go one way or the other. Well, think about Jesus' world, him healing people on the Sabbath, and the religious leaders, like, they would kick you out. It'd be worse than excommunication, right? The Jewish leaders would say, you're out of the synagogue. You can't come to worship. Like you're, it would have been really bad. And so you've got family members of these fishermen, these disciples that had come alongside Jesus, that their families, because you know they pushed pressure from the family long before they decided they were going to kill him. They went to the families and said, we're going to kick your loved one out of the synagogue if you don't get them to turn their ways. So all of these disciples on some level, had had to deal with loved ones, you would think. Now, I'm not just making stuff up. Like, this makes sense, right? Because they, they chastised Jesus. They nearly killed him a couple of times. Like, they weren't going to take his life before it was time. But we know that he walked away early. He got, he, in fact, he left Jerusalem. I don't know if you knew this. Part of the reason he was marching into Jerusalem was because after the time that they beheaded John the Baptist, it got tense. And some of the followers of John the Baptist were actually... They, they, they left John the Baptist to be followers of Jesus. And so these were people that, that they were in lockstep. That was Jesus' cousin. And so Jesus left town. He didn't run scared. He just knew it wasn't time. And so he moved further away from where the tension was in Jerusalem. So when he comes back, he knows the time is near and he's going to be there when the time is right. He knows what's imminent, but don't think for a second there wasn't already a lot of tension involved. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Jesus recognized that whenever he was talking to the woman at the well, who was a Samaritan woman, and sharing the gospel and opening up eternal life to her, rather than talking to her like she was property or a dog, like the rest of that world would have done, that that was opening all of those up to, to being abused in one way or the other. So they had stood 
with him in his trials. Are you encouraged by that? I hope you're encouraged by that. Encourage me a little bit. I hope it encourages you. He sees and he knows. The sec- next thing that you see is that he prayed for them through their struggle. Now, I'm still trying to process this fully, and I don't think I'm ever going to. But he's having this supper. He's instituted the supper that reflects his body and his blood. He's still sitting there with them, and he knows that he's about to deny him, and he's praying for him as he goes through his struggle, looking through the personal offense to the moment that he's going to turn and respond and be a key part of the kingdom of God. I'm talking about Peter. Like, this is a pretty big deal. I mean, I don't know about, like, in my humanity, I'd have pulled back. I mean, I'm not saying I would. I don't know what I'd have done, but I don't think I'd be able to do what Jesus did and say, all right, we're going to sit through this supper and we're going to act like you're not going to deny me at the fire here in a little bit. In my humanity, I wouldn't have wanted to just be gracious. Would you? Like, Jesus knew. And he knew that they would, he knew how frail they were. And what I'm telling you is that he prayed for them in spite of the struggle. So where does it say that? Verse 31. He's talking specifically now to Peter. And it says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And that when you've turned again, you will strengthen your brothers. Now, I want you all to think about this text for a minute. He's applying it specifically to Simon Peter. And he's saying, I know that you are about to go through a difficult struggle and temptation. I know that you are. In fact, the enemy came and asked for permission to do it, and it's coming. And I have interceded on your behalf to the Father that your faith would be strong through this, Peter. Now, all the while, Peter said, oh, no, I'm not going to deny you. I'm not going to deny you. He thought he was stronger than he was. But the Lord Christ is praying for him. I want you to take this for a second. And then he's praying. Look, he's, I'm giving you the last point. He expected big things despite their failures. Can I go ahead and give you the last point? I don't know if it's fair to do that in order but, um, or out of order like that. But it kind of is mixed together because he's, he's doubling down on Peter even though Peter's a mess up. He, he, the, the, the mistake, the failure that Peter's about to have is not going to... To, to keep him from accomplishing the thing that God put him together for, the thing that God built him for, the thing that God called him for. It didn't take the call away from his life and ultimately what he would become. In other words, his disappointment and the, the pain that Jesus may have experienced in the fact that Peter was frail. I mean, can we just pause a second? Fast forward to the, to the, the, the garden they're going to be in in just a few minutes. Because when they, not a few minutes, but later that evening, they would be in the garden praying and he's going to say, Peter, can you not pray and stay awake, man? I'm about to go through a thing. Like these are frail men. And Jesus is interceding on his behalf. One of the things that I learned in seminary that I've tried to practice and when I do it, it, it really is an encouragement. And I think it may be to you. I don't know if you feel like you've been going through a struggle. I don't know if you feel like life's been tough, but sometimes you ought to, you ought to personalize scripture by inserting your name. And in this space, I think it's powerful. I'm going to insert mine because I I don't want to insert yours. I don't think that'd be right. Uh, But but, but as you look at this verse, I want you to, and maybe you, as I'm inserting mine, you do yours. But instead of Simon, Simon, Steve, Steve, behold, Satan has demanded to have you. Like you're going to go through a thing. He told Job that, by the way, that he might sift you like wheat. And Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. The thought that the Savior is interceding on my behalf, even when I'm in a struggle, is a pretty stinking big deal. And Jesus actually applied this like in real time as he was acting as in the flesh as Savior. Like, like he, was, he was showing us how to live life in a way that honors God by interceding for a brother in the middle of the struggle, in the middle of the offense. And he didn't let the pain or the difficulty in that moment keep him from seeing potential down. Do y'all see the love? Like, this is next level. This is like, though, the, though they, the, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Like, we know that's not human. We know that we'd say, whoa, they're sinners. I'm dying for them. They're still sinning. Eh, call it off. I'm out. Like, that's what humans would do. When we love as Jesus loves, it means... Loving in spite of the affliction. We get some small little bit of picture of this as parents. 
Because if you're a parent and you have a child, like if you have a child that's a ragamuffin, you know you got a child that's a ragamuffin. I don't have a child that's a ragamuffin. Just thought I'd say. Um, but if you do, you know, but you don't love them any less. Not if you're any kind of a parent. And you don't cease believing that your child, you better not cease interceding on behalf of your child, that their potential is still a calling upon their life that God's capable of. And if we're to love the way that Jesus loved, then we have to be willing to love in spite of the offense, right? But I want you to take just a moment and pull yourself out of, that sh- of those shoes for a moment because we like to think of ourselves as Peter. Like, Lord, thank you for loving me in spite of me. But what if, what if you're Jesus for a minute? I know you're not Jesus, but let's just take and not let you play Peter for a moment and, or me play Peter. And, and let's look at the people that you're dealing with in life and you're Jesus and they're Peter. God's call to us, if we're going to love them as he loves them, is to intercede for them and to believe that big things are still in store for them despite their failures. Like we serve a God that believes enough in you. I'm not saying things are roses all the time. I'm not saying that there aren't consequences for things that happen. I am saying that we oftentimes write people off. We write things off. We shut doors. We ourselves, if we're not careful, become modern day Pharisees. God doesn't need any more Pharisees. Like he had enough of them at the cross. They're they're the ones that put him there. What he needs are some people that can love the way that he loved and see past the failure, unconditionally loving with expectation of what God can still do. You hearing that? Try putting your name in there sometime. I think it will be an encouragement to you. So as we come to the close and we say, well, what do we do with all this? Well, really, I want to see us set the tone. A tone of gratitude, a tone of thanksgiving for who Jesus is and what he did, a tone that causes us to want to serve and want to share. Because if we believe that Jesus is returning, and we do believe that as Christians, we, I mean, we do believe that Jesus is going to return. Well, then our basic mission is to love as he loved and give as he gave and seek for there to be more of him and less of us. And so often we get hung up in lesser things. I'm hopeful that for you, that you're hearing some of what I and feel like in my own heart that I've been hearing, which is, God, help me to love people as you loved people. I've still got some growth to go. Anybody else still got some growth to go? You don't have to raise your hand, but you're nodding enough. And even if you're not, I know. <laughs> You've got some growth to go. Um, listen, this is the time where we celebrate the supper. Um, and before we jump right in, I'm going to pray. One of the things... Listen, one of the things that's traditional, these days I think we like tradition more than we don't, which is, which is kind of strange because it's one of the ways that the world's changing. It's not a bad thing in some ways, but here's what I wanted to get at. The Bible is really clear about those that partook of this supper. Paul wrote a letter to the church at Corinth. They told him to take this serious, um, and, and he told them to all take it together at the same time, but he also talked about their heart condition. I've had people before say, I cannot take the supper. I don't feel I'm worthy. Can I just tell you, you are never, ever going to be worthy to take the supper of the Lord. You aren't worthy of salvation. You never were, never going to be. Here's what it means to be worthy in the moment. It's to be able to say to God, Lord, I don't, there's things I know that I shouldn't have done that I did or that I didn't do that I should have. I'm putting those in front of you right now and asking you just, I know you've forgiven me as far as the east is the west, but Lord, I want my slate clean before you and I don't want to abuse the grace you've provided. It just means having a clean slate before the Lord, like keeping it real with him. All right? That's where the word repentance comes in. It's a change of heart and mind. Like I see the word as God has shown me how to love people. And there may be some areas that I'm not doing it as I should. And I want to do better. I want to be more of him and less of me. So before we jump into the the bread and the, the juice, I want us to pray and ask God, to help us as we repent. Lord God, we acknowledge that we, in our humanness, but at times as our will, in, in willful disobedience, we, we struggle to love folks. Um, Lord, it comes natural. It's what we've learned. It's what's been modeled in some ways for all of us. We've seen it modeled in government and in leadership and personal relationships throughout our society. It's just natural. 
that doesn't make it okay. You have told us as believers you want us to be different. And Lord, I pray with my heart of hearts that you would help us to love as you love. Lord, I pray that you would help me to reflect what it is to, to serve, to lead by serving and loving as you did. To be able to, in the middle of the difficult space and in the struggle, know that you are interceding, that you see all, to know, to know, Father, not just that it's worth it, but Father, also to know that you care. You care. There's potential in me in that calling, and there's potential in others in the calling in their life, despite our frailty. Because you didn't choose those disciples because they were perfect. You called them because they were willing and they sought to be obedient, and you did amazing things in their life. Lord, we pray you do God-sized things in our life in spite of us. Where we have failed, we repent, and we turn from those things, and we ask for your forgiveness. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, Jesus handed them. He didn't stop the supper in spite of who they were. He handed them the bread. And he changed the supper they were used to all together. And he said, I don't think they got it. They didn't. They didn't get it all right then. But he said, this, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. They were clueless. And yet he was setting a tone for the days ahead. And he said to them, take and eat in remembrance of me. And then on that same night, moments later, he took the cup and he, they, passed, they passed a single cup, I'm sure. And he told them that this is the new covenant of my blood. It says it right there in Luke. It's a picture of what happened in Jeremiah. But again, he loved them so much that he knew their unfaithfulness was en route. He knew that they were going to be imperfect and he loved them anyway. Anybody else be grateful for a spouse that loves them in spite of their not getting the words right every time? Not getting every Mother's Day right? Let's kind of prepare in advance, right? Uh, not, I mean, I'm grateful that people love us in spite of us. Jesus loves us in spite of us. And he says, this, guys, is the new covenant in my blood. Remember me. Remember my grace and how I love this and my sacrifice as often as you drink it. Would you stand together with me? This is about all I know how to do this year, getting ready for Easter. I think it's enough. I think it's enough. I think, he's, I think we're hearing. I, I sense that you guys, you're getting it. Let's pray together. Father, help us to love as you love. Thank you for a, a congregation of people today in both services that have, Lord, they've listened. And we have celebrated in a special way, like the scripture teach is set the supper is sacred and there's something about believers together like we are your body you made the body you have described those that call upon Jesus as Savior as perfect under the blood of Jesus not because we're perfect but because we're under the blood of Jesus and so Lord help us to serve you and help us to love and may all see who you are because of how we love others May it be so this week, Lord. In Jesus' name, may it be so. Help us as we come back in a week and we celebrate the resurrection. We love you, Lord God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All God's people said? Amen. All right. Y'all go be blessed.